Avoiding Cure Inhibition with Platinum Silicone. In this tutorial, we're going to explain some common contaminants for platinum silicones and just some general good practice to avoid platinum silicone contamination and cure inhibition in general and some extra ways around that when uh, cure inhibition might be unavoidable. Now to begin, it's really important to understand that terminology of cure inhibition, of what exactly that means. Some of you just starting out working with silicone may be unfamiliar with that terminology. And what that means, cure inhibition, is silicones cure. They do not air dry, which means they can react with contaminants that they come in contact with. And in the case of platinum silicones, platinum silicone is very sensitive. So in that state, when it's uncured, that's where something could inhibit that cure or stop the curing process. Now, typically what we have to watch out for is things like 3D printed parts or clays that might be contaminated with sulfur. And what happens is when that cure process is interrupted, the silicone fails to cross-link at that surface point where it interacts with the contaminant, resulting in that cure inhibition. This means the silicone is either sticky or does not cure at all and stays in a liquid state. And this can either ruin the surface of a mold or the entire mold could not cure if the contaminant is strong enough. If you do mold making for any length of time over a variety of surfaces, you're more than likely to encounter cure inhibition at some point, be it against a pattern surface or a mixing bucket surface or uh, through an entire mold that causes the entire mold to go bad. So it's really important to understand the common causes of cure inhibition and learn how to avoid those problems and avoid those common contaminants. Now to start, let's go over the common contaminants of platinum silicone. Now, this is a by no means a full list, and this is one of those very frustrating things with platinum silicones because there are a lot of potential contaminants because, again, this is sensitive chemistry, but these are the most common things in our universe that you want to be careful about. Now, first off, we have tin cure silicone. This is like kryptonite to platinum silicone, and of course polyurethane rubbers, masking tape, some paints and clear sealers. And an important side note here, a lot of paints and sealers that work fine when they're completely cured don't work fine when they're still drying or still curing. So important to make sure that if you are using a compatible sealer that it is also completely dry. And of course materials and clays containing sulfur, latex rubber, vulcanized rubber, aloe vera, and some SLA resins and 3D printing materials. Now I have to qualify that by saying some SLA resins and some 3D printing materials because there are so many and that is an emerging market that has so many uh, different possibilities for print materials that it's impossible for us to keep up with them all. So when in doubt, run a small test, but we'll get into that more here in just a minute. Now another important factor is of course your work environment. It is highly important to make sure that you're working in a room temperature work environment. Obviously, anything lower than room temperature or 70 to 75 degrees will start to change the properties of the way the silicone cures. So remember, if you're working in a cold area, that will retard the cure and will open up your platinum silicone to contaminants that might not normally affect it. And it should go without saying that you want to be as accurate as possible and use clean stir sticks and mixing buckets that have not been contaminated with other mold making materials. Now at this point you're probably asking yourself, why would I use a platinum silicone? These silicones sound like nothing but trouble. Now this is where it's important to understand the role of platinum silicone in our molding and casting universe. The benefits of platinum silicone are long lasting molds, you have molds that could last decades, low to nil shrinkage. Most of our platinum silicones exhibit so low of shrinkage that it is very difficult if not impossible to measure. Better elongation and strength and more casting material options. Platinum silicones are imperative if you're going to be casting any kind of aliphatic clear resin. 
and of course, greater range of formulas. Platinum Chemistry has opened up the possibility of a lot of really super soft, very stable silicones, and very firm and even low viscosity silicones. And of course, the one-to-one -one silicone formulas, that is one of the big achievements in silicone chemistry in the last couple of decades. And that, of course, has made platinum silicone chemistry a lot more accessible to the molding and casting community. Now, sometimes a pattern surface may be wildly incompatible with any platinum silicone, in which case, if you really have to have a platinum silicone mold, say you're casting an aliphatic clear resin, then the best way to approach that is to mold it twice. First, with tin cure silicone, then pull a polyurethane resin pattern, like say with ArtCast or TC800, and then remold that resin pattern with an appropriate platinum silicone for the cast casting application that you have. But just remember that does add extra expense, but sometimes that's necessary in order to get a compatible mold material. Now, two important takeaways from this video is one, I'm going to show how to prepare a sculpture in sulfur-free clay and how to prepare that against mild contaminants when you're making a platinum silicone mold but also how to spot contaminants and how to run a test ahead of time for potential contaminants in your sculpture or your pattern surface. Now, NSP is non-sulfur clay, but occasionally can have some mild contaminants in it that can interfere with the cure of platinum silicone, especially in cold weather. So we're going to go over some important tips for preparing a sculpture using NSP clay. And here's what I recommend. Sealing the clay with two coats of ClearGuard lacquer and allowing the lacquer to dry completely in both coats. Sometimes that might take a couple of hours in cooler weather. And then spraying a release, a non-silicone oil mold release, and we'll get into that more in a minute, and allowing that mold release to dry completely. Now, one of the reasons that I recommend the ClearGuard lacquer is there was a formula change with Krylon Crystal Clear a few years ago. And I've heard back from a lot of customers that a lot of those sealing methods that we used to recommend do not work anymore using Krylon Crystal Clear. Now, thankfully, ClearGuard from Scope Nouveau, and that, of course, is available on our website. This is a clear lacquer that does not inhibit platinum silicone, but very important. We're going to spray two layers of that onto our clay, but it's really important that you let that dry completely between layers. And in cooler weather, remember that might take a little bit longer. So with this, I sprayed on two coats of clear guard lacquer, and then I let that dry for about an hour before I sprayed on my mold release. So again, make sure you get that sprayed on all over your sculpture and allow it plenty of time to dry. Now we're going to spray on some Zip 301 non-silicone mold release. Now that's really important. Mold releases that contain silicone oil should never be used for silicone mold making because they will lead to the silicone bonding to your pattern. Now, once we've allowed everything to dry completely, which once I spray on my mold release, I like to let everything sit for at least 20 to 30 minutes. But remember that in colder temperatures, that dry time can take longer. So make sure, again, ideally you're working in a room temperature work environment of 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I'm mixing up some 5130 silicone here for our test. Now 5130 is a about a 30 minute working time and a four hour set time or four hour cure. Now that 30 minute working time, remember the entire time that that silicone is in its uncured state, that's when it's susceptible to cure inhibition. So it's really important to be mindful of everything the silicone will come in contact with in its uncured state. Now I'm just mixing up a small batch of the 5130 just to run a cure inhibition test on a few different surfaces. And because I'm doing this on some weird surfaces, some of them vertical, I'm doing two things. I'm adding some white pigment there, you see, that's turned that to a white silicone because normally 5130 is just a colorless translucent. And by adding some of the Thixo to this, I'm going to convert it to a thick paste or a Thixotropic paste. Because again, 5130 is normally just a translucent, 
pourable silicone, but by adding a little bit of the Thixo, about 1% or so, converts this to a Thixotropic paste that can be brushed on to a vertical surface. And this is really important if you're going to be molding sculptures, especially for art bronze and that sort of thing, where you're molding large upright sculptures, busts, and things like that, that uh, don't make sense to pour in large block molds or blanket molds. Now I mainly added the white silicone pigment so we can see where we're applying the silicone. Sometimes when you're working with a uh, translucent or clear silicone, it's real easy to just wind up creating a bunch of little puddles that are kind of hard to see on your work surface. So just adding a little bit of that white silicone pigment helps me track where I'm applying the silicone. And Again, should go without saying that uh, make sure that you're measuring as accurately as possible. Anytime you're working with platinum silicone in any room temperature cure material, remember that accuracy is the key to success. If you are inaccurate with your mixing and measuring, then you up your chances for cure inhibition exponentially. Now here I'm applying some of the 5130 to that clay block that I prepared with the sealer and the mold release. So again, this has had plenty of time to dry, but we applied two coats of the sealer of the clear guard mat, and then of course a light spray of the Zip 301 mold release. And all of that was allowed to dry. Now just for fun, because I had a large batch mixed up, about uh, 200 grams of platinum silicone ready to go here, so I thought I'd show you some other surfaces as well. So this is a good thing to do anytime you're working with a new material. Mix up some and apply it to some different surfaces so you can see what surfaces might have issues later on. And if those surfaces might also require a sealer, or if they're just completely incompatible. But here I'm applying it to a uh, some a couple of pieces of resin, some uh, TC800 there. And I'm also going to apply some to a scrap piece of protolina clay. Now protolina clay is great because it's a, a utility clay. You can also sculpt with it, but it has a very simple formula, it has as few ingredients as possible. So it is great with platinum silicone. And when I say utility clay, this is great for making mold walls, dividing walls, that sort of thing. And last but not least, I'm going to open up a fresh block of NSP Medium Brown, and we're going to do a small test on that as well, just to contrast that with the block of the NSP Green that we prepared with the clear lacquer and, of course, the Zip 301 spray release. And the main reason I want to show this is even though these are sulfur-free clays, occasionally, especially in the wintertime, this is in the, the wintertime in my shop here in Texas, and the colder temperatures can allow the silicone to be inhibited by things that it might not be inhibited by in warmer environments or warmer weather. Now 5130 silicone has a 30 minute working time and about a four hour demold at room temperature. Just remember colder weather will slow that down. Warmer weather will speed that up. And it's always a good idea to make sure you keep your mixing cup with whatever's left over inside it. And that's a great way to test your work. And that's a good control group for your test because whatever's in the mixing cup, if that comes out clean, that's a good indication that the silicone is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. And now it's up to those pattern surfaces to see if uh, cure inhibition happened or not. But if everything worked in your mixing cup, but uh, things are not working on your patterns, then that's a good indicator that there's something on your pattern surfaces inhibiting the silicone. Now, our first test there with the NSP Green that's sealed and released came off beautifully. You see that uh, came off without any issue, no cure inhibition whatsoever. And now we have the block that we did not seal. And here you see that sadly we do have cure inhibition. Now when cure inhibition like this occurs, that means we have a couple of options. But most importantly, this is exactly why you want to do a test. Anytime you're applying a, a silicone formula that's new to you, or you're applying a silicone that you've used many times before to an unknown surface, it's always a good idea to run a test first. And that way we don't have to clean uncured silicone off a delicate sculpture. But here we have two options. We can either, if the contaminant is mild enough, we can just seal and release it like we did with the green block of clay. 
or if we're dealing with a very severe contaminant or a possibly uh, completely incompatible surface, then that's where we fall back to molding it with a different material and if necessary, then pouring up a resin pattern like say with the TC800 or ArtCast resin and then remold it with the platinum silicone appropriate for our casting material. So there you have the process of testing for contaminants and of course preparing sculpture for mold making using platinum silicones. Now one final note, it's important to remember that your skill level, your aptitude, and your experience, you are the biggest variable in this process. So remember, the more skill you have, the more experience you have, the better success you'll have using molding and casting products. But very important, I cannot stress this enough, the more you practice with material and the more accurate you are in your mixing and measuring and control of temperature, the better your results will be. Now, for those of you who want to learn some more and hear more of my crazy molding and casting ramblings, be sure to check the video description. I'll put a link to our video library where I have a lot of resources on molding, casting, and special effects. So be sure to check that out. And of course, all of the molding and casting materials in our tutorials are available at brickintheyard.com. Now, as is YouTube custom, if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. And of course, click the little bell icon so you get notified when we post new content. And thanks again for watching.